everybody. Welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed, the television edition. I'm Matt Connerton. It is May 4th, 2016. And uh, we are here uh, this week with, uh, we have a guest who I will introduce in just a moment. But uh, I do want to remind everybody, of course, that uh, the show, we're live uh, Wednesdays, Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. But we also do archive all the shows on our YouTube page on IPM Nation. If you go to ipmnation.com and you click the YouTube link in the upper left, it'll take you right there. Uh, this show, uh, John Hopwood's show, Ward 13, Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades, all those shows, uh, we do put up there. And, of course, you can hear the radio edition of Unleashed five nights a week on IPM Nation 2. And, uh, and we do archive all of those as well. So uh, our guest uh, today came to us uh, via uh, Slicko, who hosts a show called Slicko's World, which you can hear now Sunday nights on IPM Nation 2. And uh, Slicko's been with us from really the beginning of IPM Nation. Uh, but uh, he referred me to this gentleman who I'm very excited to talk about. We have with us uh, today uh, Sean Michelonis. How are you, sir? I'm doing awesome. Did I get the last name right? Yeah, All completely right. correct. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you live in Rochester? I live in Rochester, New Hampshire. Okay, which is where Slicko's from. So Absolutely. Um, so we should clarify that right out of the gate because uh, Janet Del Fuco, who was uh, on the show, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> Um, she kind of went at you a little bit on Facebook. Just had some questions about your uh, your residency. Yeah, but you are you are a, a Rochester, New Hampshire resident. Actually, I've been a New Hampshire resident for a long, long time. I actually graduated. I went to Summersworth Middle School. I went to Summersworth High School, where okay. I graduated. Yeah, and um, I lived in Stratford County for the, for a long, long time. I yeah. went to University of Massachusetts Lowell, which I moved to Mass temporarily for school purposes, yeah. where I was a legislator and um, got my education through UMass Lowell and um, always been focused on the state of New Hampshire and trying to do what's right for our citizens. You were a uh, legislator, correct? I was a former New Hampshire legislator out of Rochester District 1 okay. before the redistricting. Um, I represented the entire city of Rochester, New Hampshire through 2006, 2008. Yeah. Plus, um, I am also held uh, I was also a supervisor of uh, a uh, voter checklist for Ward 1 for the city of Rochester. Yeah. I also helped the Secretary of State, Bill Gardner, uh, revamp the entire state voter registration list as well. I did a lot of donation, uh, donated my time pretty much to do that, yeah. to kind of help out around the thing. So that it wouldn't cost the state any more money than what's already been misappropriated. And you're a Democrat, correct? I'm on a Democratic um, slate. But I'm completely different than a normal politician. I'm, I'm very more of a middle-of-the-road type of individual. Mm -hmm. um, I don't look at a, a party affiliation as, you know, key. Is I'm not going to vote Democrat just because I'm a Democrat. Yeah. I'm a type of person that looks, listens to the constituents where I live, not just where I live, but around me in different towns and cities, and I implement their will which that's exactly what we're supposed to do as elected officials. Mm -hmm. And um, I do a lot of outreach for the community, and I do a lot of things on the lines of um, doing fundraising for charitable uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. And I like to tackle issues as they come and do it the right way and do it a physical responsibly. Uh, to make sure that we don't have any downshifting coming down to our communities. So are you at odds with the Democratic Party on, on some issues, or were you when you were in the, uh, in the, the House? When, in I was a, House? when I first was elected to New Hampshire House of Representatives, I was a little wet behind the ears, so to speak. Um, I ended up getting in there not knowing exactly um, what I was supposed to do, mm -hmm. um, how did it work, and I didn't know the process on 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 the voting and so on and so forth. Which D did you not have a mentor? Because I know some people when they get elected, they have a, a mentor who helps them, and some people are kind of just on their own and have to. The, to be absolutely uh, honest with you, uh, no, I did not have a mentor because yeah. the simple fact is I, I am one of these people that likes to be. Uh, independent thinker. Yeah. Um, I don't like to be... A lot of Democrats don't like that. <laughs> they No, they don't like that. A lot of Republicans don't like that either. That's very true, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and the, the funny thing about the whole situation, when I first got in, the, um, was elected to the state legislative branch, um, I ended up, the first year, I made a lot of mistakes. 
I was a rookie. Mm-hmm. I was new to it, you know, and, you know, I should have did more due diligence when I was there. Well, when you say mistakes, like, what do you mean, in, in terms of voting? Or? Uh, on the terms of voting, I, what I should have done is I did read the, the bills uh, yeah. before I voted on them. But what I should have done is took a stance on the lines that I should have researched it more. Sure. Looked out outside. I should have crossed the aisle more, like the Republican Party, mm-hmm. and see what they had and kind of read at it at both aspects. And what I should have done is voted from the facts mm-hmm. and circumstances. I yeah. made those mistakes when I first was elected. Yeah. But my second year, I turned it all around. I, I, I ended up sponsoring a bunch of bills. Um, I put in, tried to implement the community's will, and I researched everything before I voted. Sure. I ended up voting against the entire state budget because I knew it was not stabilized. It wasn't right. Mm-hmm. It just, it was a lot of cost shifting for the years to the next year to the next year, and we don't need that. We yeah. need to deal with the situation as it is and in front of us and not shift it on to the next year or the next legislative body. Well, I can see where that might put you at <coughs> odds with, with your own party because uh, that sounds, when you say something like that, it sounds more like something a Republican might say. You know, we need to actually be responsible with our budget. <laughs> um, honestly, I'm a realist, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It, I, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. Yeah. I mean, I am always voted Democrat, yeah. okay? I've always... Um, uh, ran for office as a Democrat, and I will continue to do so. Yeah. But if my party or any other party looks at me bad and badly because I'm speaking the you know speaking out and speaking for the will of people, then I don't mind if they throw right. me out of a party. Right. Because that absolutely that's not what elected officials are supposed to do. Yeah. They are supposed to fight for the people. And voice the concern and represent the people to the fullest, not self-interest, not party affiliation, and they're not supposed to look at their own will and for their own gain. Yeah, that's in- inappropriate for the people, and that's not right. Part of why I'm so interested in that is mm-hmm. it's just I, I can sort of relate to a lot of what you're saying. Um, I was a, a registered Democrat up until the mid 2000s, mm-hmm. and then I switched to independent. I've never run for office just as a voter Um, and then moved to Manchester and ended up re-registering as a Democrat, really for ballot access reasons. Um, I've been uh, encouraged by some people to run. Maybe I will. Uh, Maybe I'll I'll run for the legislature. But um, but if I do so, I'll I'll do it as a Democrat because, you know, I, I consider myself an independent. And if I run and I win, the you know, my so called fellow Democrats are going to hate me a lot of the time. But uh, but I don't you know, but I don't feel like I belong in a party, but it's but it's it's very difficult to run and win as an independent. So it's almost like you have to not that you have to, because some people can make it work. But it's like you kind of have to you kind of have to pick a side to even to even get a shot at it. You know, that's how the state of New Hampshire is. Yeah, they give you a choice. That's how it is everywhere. Uh, they, they don't make it easy for, you know, the two-party yeah. system, they really kind of keep the whole thing on lockdown. They don't make it easy for independents, for libertarians. And when I was a legislator, and, you know, this is really important to me because when I was there, I noticed a lot of things I did not like, mm-hmm. okay? One of the major things is there was a lot of behind-the-scenes type of talks. Like, if you – I will support your bill if you support my bill. Right. You know, yeah. you, you can't do stuff like that. Right. You know, what you got to do is if you're going to will into support a bill, you need to support it 150%. And you got to do it for the will of the people. Right. Okay. Yeah. You don't support a bill just because you need that little itch. <laughs> right. That That's unacceptable. Yeah. That's backdoor politics. Yeah. I'm not about that. Yeah. Um, I won't take special interest groups. That's another thing is one of the uh, the major things I saw are a lot of lobbyists up there mm-hmm. trying to pull people in different directions. And, and, you know, I can understand why they would have lobbyists, but that's why we have the process. The process is going to the legislative committees mm-hmm. and fighting there and try to grab those legislators and try to get their attention and prove your point. Right. And then that's when the committee will vote on it, you know, together and say, we recommend it or we don't. Um, and I, I honestly, when we have a voted day, like, um, and we would vote up or down on a bill, 
um, a lot of lobbyists would be up in the galley or out sure. in the hallway and trying to get our votes. I w honestly, I would walk right past them like yeah. they weren't there because of the yeah. simple fact is I'm not trying to be rude or disrespectful. But on the other hand, I am. My mind is focusing on how I'm going to vote and what I'm going to do to help people at the same time making sure that we're keeping the budget in check so we don't downshift that into our communities right. and our taxpayers and our homeowners. Yeah. And, you know, we have to think about them, yeah. you know, and we don't. And a lot of times they don't. I do. Right. And um, <laughs> so. So now you're running for the executive council. So for those who don't know, what is the New Hampshire executive council? The New Hampshire executive council is is a.k.a. the Governor's Council. Mm -hmm. There's uh, five elected officials, uh, five different districts throughout New Hampshire. They sit with the governors, and they do appropriation of monies throughout the state. Yeah. They appoint judges. They appoint department heads. Um, they they honor people that belong to, you know, uh, deserve to be honored yeah. in society. A lot of people push out. Um, they do all the appropriations of 10000 or above. Okay. Um, with that being said, um, one of the major things when we're talking about appropriations, which I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very a little, pretty upset about, um, a lot of the appropriations that has been going on would say, like we got a huge heroin epidemic right now mm -hmm. in New Hampshire, and not just in New Hampshire across the country, and it's getting worse. Uh, you know, like myself, I lost 23 friends since January. Yeah, I remember you telling me that on the phone. That's stunning. And um, and I got a funeral to go to next week that I need to show up to yeah. and um and and just be there for support. Sure. Um, so with that being said, you know I feel if the state or the state police or our law enforcement agencies um, end up arresting a drug dealer and we confiscate their funds in their house in their car, instead of taking those monies and putting them into the general fund to help try to stabilize the budget mm -hmm. we need to put that into drug treatment programs well see i disagree though with uh uh so you're really you're talking about civil asset forfeiture yeah which i absolutely fundamentally disagree with i mean i like the idea if you're going to do something with the money yes that would be a, a good thing to do yeah. with it but i don't agree with seizing that money without due process i think i think civil asset forfeiture by nature is completely unconstitutional Completely understand. I completely agree with you. And when, let me re, you know, I'm saying if you're convicted of a crime, mm -hmm. okay, and you are found guilty by your peers, right. okay, and the state takes that money because of drug uh, trafficking, okay, so to speak, that's when that money shouldn't go into the general fund. It should go into drug treatment programs mm -hmm. because we got a lot of suffering addicts out there sure. that really need help and have nowhere else to go. Yeah. Okay. But that's only going through the process of due process, um, making sure that if they committed a crime and they found guilty by their peers, then they got to pay the consequences for their crime. Right. And part of the consequences for their crime is for the forfeiture of their monies. Right. Through, because you don't know whether or not it was pulled from dealing drugs or dealing heroin on the streets. So that's what I meant by it. Uh, okay. I, I should have kind of elaborated. Sure, no, but, 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 no, but it, it's, it's a very important... I'm glad you went there with that because it's an important topic that doesn't get discussed enough, at least not in this state, Absolutely. is uh, civil forfeit asset. Uh, uh, sometimes I, it's almost like I'm dyslexic with that one phrase and I end up saying civil forfeit asset or civil asset forfeiture. Um, <laughs> it's something that, that, uh, that isn't talked about enough. Absolutely. And, uh, but, uh, but I don't necessarily, although I'm still not sure, I'm, I'm not sure I'm 100% comfortable with it because you even said, we don't know. So if someone is arrested for, for dealing drugs, we don't know if that money was gotten from, drugs, uh, from the selling of drugs. So therefore, that puts a little bit of doubt in my mind. But I don't, but I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't disagree with the principle of if you're going to take that money, use it for the right thing. Um, one thing I will emphasize, and I, you know, and I think you would understand what I'm talking about. If we have a drug dealer that is dealing heroin and killing off people, it's pretty much what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously they're not telling them, hey, take it. You know, it's right. th their choice. But right. 
they're pushing heroin, they're pushing drugs, okay? Yeah. At that point, you don't know, you're absolutely right, you don't know where they're getting their money from or whatever, if it was the heroin and so on and so forth. Right. But you shouldn't be making that choice to deal those drugs onto society. Yeah. That no, is, I agree with you. I, and, I, and that's no, I think, punishment. Yeah. No, heroin dealers are scumbags. I, I, I feel that very strongly. Um, what would you do, though, about... So, are you... How do we reform how we treat heroin addicts? Because um, should we decriminalize use of heroin? Absolutely not. I mean, we cannot decriminalize a, a drug that is killing people. We can't do it. But right but, now, we treat them like criminals and lock them in jail, but that's which doesn't, a, doesn't fix anything. That's not 150% true either, because the legislative body has passed laws stating that the, we're pretty much uh, stating laws that you can arrest somebody that is overdosed. We're tying law enforcement hands, and that the system and the legislative body has been doing a lot of feel-good legislation on this, mm-hmm. um, which is also indicating that by tying their hands, you're getting the, the addict the, the necessary help to revive them, and you're giving them Narcam to revive them. Right, right. But then you're sending them back on, out on the streets. Right. Can't do that because you're enabling them to do it again feeling that they're going to do it. And plus, they feel that they're safe. Even if they have a bag of heroin on the table, the law enforcement cannot really do anything about it because of the simple fact how the law states. Mm-hmm. Um, they have to have a warrant to go back into the house. But at that point, the evidence could be gone. It could be flushed. It could be out of the house if they go back. And nine times out of ten, these people, are, uh, you know, dealers and addicts are going to get rid of their supplies because they don't want to be arrested yeah. and when the officer goes back with a warrant. Um, with that being said, I mean, one of the major deals and one of my major ideas is, um, and we have to look at the fiscal, you know, the money's about it, and we have to kind of look into it more. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, not just one person needs to look into it. I mean, a, a group of people need to work and look on, at it together. Um, with all the New Hampshire Executive Council, including the governor, um, or whoever's the governor at the, you know, if I get elected and when sure. I get elected, um, who the governor is going to be. Yeah. But it's going to have to be a joint effort, not just with law enforcement, but with physicians and counselors and so on and so forth. Um, and we need to sit down and kind of think of a, a, a good way to, to tackle this, keep the budget, you know, the money's even so we're not spending a, a huge a lot of money but i know there also is grants with the federal government which i'm pretty sure i'm not sure 150 percent but i'm pretty sure that our united states senators both shaheen and ayat have been trying to push to try to get some of that money into new hampshire mm-hmm. um what we need to do in the way i need to do it uh, to do it is you can't stop an addict from picking up a needle and shooting up Right. But you can give them the choice. What would you like? What would you prefer? So if I overdose today, okay, and I'm on the floor, law enforcement's called. They come down. They they pretty much bring me to the hospital. They check me. They make sure I'm, I'm good. They, they, they hook you up with an Narcan and so on and so forth. Um, what I think they need to do is hold them for 24 hours on a blue paper situation let them be coherent so they can understand what you're telling them because if you're under the influence of drugs you're not coherent sure, sure. coherent I, don't know, I can't even talk today coherent, <laughs> coherent enough to uh, make a you know adequate choice yeah. give them a choice this is your choice you're going to serve some time in jail for having a possession of heroin or go into a drug treatment program 6 months drug treatment program not and, and let them know that you're not going to get supplemental drugs, another drug, to weed you off heroin. You're going to have to do it cold turkey. And that's the only way. And I know some addicts that have got off from heroin, and they didn't take the choice of methadone or they didn't take the, of Suboxone. Suboxone yeah. What they did is we went cold turkey yeah. with support of their family members. Yeah, yeah. And 
and they were not enabled by their family members either. Right. Um, and when they went cold turkey, now they're, they're absolutely good people in society that are actually working hard, and they've been working with me to help try to stop this epidemic or put a dent in this epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the biggest things is by giving them this choice, like we'll go back to this subject about giving them this choice, they go in, they go in for six months, Nine times out of ten, they're not going to go right back to heroin on the streets because they're getting at all the drugs out of their system. Yeah. Okay? With a little bit of counseling. And plus, you know, uh, um, they'll be able to, you know, survive and be able to be pushed on with the proper support mechanisms at home. Mm -hmm. Like having your, 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 your loved ones being there to support you and try to keep you on a straight and arrow. Um, and I think it would work. I mean, would it work 150%? No, nothing ever does. Right, right. But it would make a huge dent in it. it we, if we could save one person, um, that's it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the cost as attributes, a lot of because I know a lot of people are thinking, where are we going to get the money for this? Right. Okay. We're required by the federal government to have medical insurance right now. Okay. If not, we're penalized for it. The medical insurance companies will pay to a certain extent as long as you're not on it for the rest of your life. Sure. So with that being said is the medical insurance can pick in, you know, kick in some of this money through their insurance companies if they have insurance, okay? Um, nine times out of ten, they do have insurance. In New Hampshire, there's a lot of uninsured people in New Hampshire who cannot uh, afford. Absolutely. Uh, the, the Affordable Care Act has not been so successful in this state in a lot of ways. There's a lot of people yeah, I'm not who a, do not have insurance right now in this state. I, I'm not a, a be uh, I'm not a supporter of that whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, you can't mandate people. Yeah. Um, because mandating sometimes turns into a situation that you know creates chaos or puts us all in a situation where we can't afford it. Yeah. Like in myself, I don't have medical insurance right now either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I work hard every day. You know, I, I, I'm a blue collar worker and I, you know, I do whatever necessary to survive, but at the same time, support my family at the same time. Yeah. Plus I'm running for office, which is very important to me. And I'm always willing to, to step outside the box and help somebody. Yeah. And yeah. that's how I am. If I have a like 20 bucks in my pocket and somebody needs that 20 bucks, I will help them out. Yeah. You know, that's just the way it is if I know that they're going to do something good for themselves. Right. right. And they're trying to, you know, survive with their family. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but with that being said, I mean, there's a lot of avenues that we're, we're going to have to look at. I mean, I'm not 150% sure. I have a good idea and I have a good way of doing it. And I know what needs to be done to get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do need a you know, like I told you, a think tank, a bunch of different people sitting together and think of ways of financially sustaining this. Yeah. Um, it's going to help people out. Um, at the same time, it, it's going to help put a dent in this epidemic that is going to help our future kids survive. And we need to do it now. Um, like one of the biggest things that I just read recently I had a friend that is a, a chief of police within the state of New Hampshire, I'm not going to say which department, mm -hmm. gave me a call and said, hey, can you help me do a huge push online or, uh, on Facebook and social media to push out the fact of this W18 drug, this new thing that is coming out? Yeah, you had mentioned this to me on the phone, and I, I hadn't heard of it before, but I guess it's pretty uh, pretty bad stuff. Yeah, it, like if you go on my Facebook, because um, you're, you're friends with me on Facebook, yeah. you'll see my post on it, and uh, WMUR actually did a report about this. Um, and one of the biggest things is, is it's 100 times more deadly than the heroin that we have on the street. Because wow. what they're doing is they're taking heroin instead of cutting it with uh, fentanyl, they're cutting it with this new drug, which is killing people even quicker. Okay. And it just started hitting the streets. And we need to, you know, tell our loved ones and the ones we care about that they need to stay away from this because they're at risk at, of dying from it. Worse than they are dealing with heroin with fentanyl included into it. Yeah. Um, 
So with that being said, I mean, that's what we need to do is we all need to work together and look after our neighbors, regardless if you like them, regardless you, you dislike them, or regardless that you're best friends in the world. We need to kind of look after each other. Right. You know, like know your neighbor. Yeah. Um, so we can actually help each other to progress. You don't have to hang out with them. You don't have to eat dinner with them. Yeah, I don't want to eat dinner with my neighbors. So. Yeah, me neither sometimes. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's but, <laughs> but by communication, yeah, you can you can make waves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's get back to the executive council because I'm curious yeah. why the executive council. I decided on the executive council. I mean, the New Hampshire Democratic Party has been approaching me about running for state rep again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've been there. I've done that. Yeah. You have a certain amount of vote. Uh, you know how the the system is now. You're running in one ward, ward or mm -hmm. two wards in the city of Rochester. Um, that's I'm gonna be able to help people, and I'm gonna be able to voice people's concern at that level. But there's 400, you know, state reps. Yeah. What is, is it? The third largest uh, elective elected I'm, legislative body in the world, I think? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and one of those things is I only can do so much at that level. Right. If I'm elected to the New Hampshire Executive Council, I'll have some kind of pull or some kind of say-so when it comes to the state budget, which would help people in general and help property tax owners more than more efficiently. There's a lot of people that can't even pay their property taxes. By the way, now, because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated by process, is it accurate to say that the – that the New Hampshire governorship is constitutionally pretty weak compared to most states in that there isn't much that the governor can actually do without the executive council's approval? Um, I mean, I know we're not the only state. Like, like Texas is, is, is like that, too, apparently. Uh, but uh, it's, kind, you know, honestly, like, it's kind of weak. But on the other hand, it's not weak because the, the governor has veto power. Yeah, they they have an overall say. They could turn around and say, "Well, they, the legislative body can submit a bill, um, send it off to the Senate. They could both approve it, and guess what? The governor can veto it." And right. I mean, she doesn't need the uh, executive the uh, executive council to no, veto she doesn't. something. No, obviously, yeah. no, she doesn't. If she doesn't agree, and you know, she she has a problem with it, she can veto it. Right. You know, and she, that's powerful enough on its own. And she doesn't need the executive council to sign something either, right? It's it's strictly yeah uh, appropriations and absolutely. Whatnot. Okay. And you know, when it comes to the bill coming, to, she can vote and she can veto. But the executive council does recommend whether or not she should do it. And yeah. there's, if there's a financial aspect to that bill, it, you know, the executive council has a say-so when it comes to that. Okay. So, you know, because they, they're the, so to speak, the watchdogs of the state budget. You know what I mean? So they have a lot of power. At the same time, um, the executive council doesn't absolutely always do their job either. Because executive council, they go, they sit down, they look at things or whatever. Do you ever see them out in the community? Do you ever see them actually talking to people? No. Do no. you ever have them go to the county commissioners and sit sit in on, on a uh, on a meeting with them? No, they don't. No. They no. sit behind on their desk and so on and so forth. They are busy individuals. Sure. I, I get sure. that. Yeah. But you always should make time for the community. Yeah. And the other legislator. Be visible. Mm -hmm. Be able to be approachable. You know, I, I've made numerous calls, and I'm not going to talk mm -hmm. about, you know, because I'm not a negative person, and because I, I believe negativity always creates more negativity. Sure. But I have approached executive council of the past, um, and they never even call you back. Yeah. And that's absolutely irresponsible. Yeah. That is not right. Especially if you have something majorly important mm -hmm. to tell them or try to get off to them, okay? They should take people's things. That's how I am. Yeah. If someone calls me, I'm going to respond to you. Right. I will return your phone call back. Right, right. It might not be that day, that, that minute, that hour, but within 24 hours, I will get back to you Yeah. and message back to you. Um, and I'm also the type of person is I, if I'm elected and when I'm elected – I will go to each of the county meetings and meet with the executive, um, not the executive council. I'm tripping myself up now. <laughs> um, 
I would meet with the county commissioners and make sure that we are all on the same page. Right. Okay. I would also meet with the delegations at each of the counties as well and make sure that we're on the same page as well. Yeah. You know, and, you know, if there's a major issue, plus I'll do community events to get the public to come out and actually talk to me, you know, and open it up, which I, when I was a legislator, I used to do that all the time. Yeah. Have them come out, tell me the feedback. Sometimes I had a good turnout. Sometimes no one showed up. How long is the term in the executive council? Two years. Two years. And is that a full time paying gig as opposed to with the state legislature? They give you a hundred bucks a year of stipend and I think tolls, right? Honestly, <laughs> I have no clue. Yeah. And because you, I, you know, you because you got a full time job and you got a family to support and whatnot. So the way I look at it is okay. I don't know whether or not it's a full time. I know it's a full time job. Yeah. It, it's a lot involved with it. Oh yeah. Which, when I was a legislator, I was there five days a week anyways. Sure. Because you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was on the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee, which is a very active committee yeah. in this state. Yeah. Um, but I don't mind how much they pay me. I don't care even if they pay me anything. Right. You know, I'm doing it not for pay. I'm doing it to help people and actually voice the concerns of the public. Yeah. That's the most important thing to me. Yeah. You know? I know how it is not to have a voice, mm -hmm. okay? So I want to be that voice for the people that don't speak up for themselves. Right. Okay? And we have a lot of people like that. Our youth, and, you know, most of the people that vote nowadays, it's, it's kind of pathetic because it's, the, you know, from 30 on up most of the time. You've got the college kids voting, yes. But there's a huge market out there of people not voting mm -hmm. or don't care. Or feel like their voice is not being heard. Yeah. You know, and, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. Part of that, I think, is um, has been reinforced by, you look at the current presidential race, and you've got, <laughs> for the Democrats, you've got all these, um, I've been I've been making little uh, snippy remarks on uh, Facebook, like, uh, remember, kids, your vote counts, except when it doesn't. You know, you've got <coughs> Bernie Sanders wins all these primaries, and... But they, they manipulate the system so that Hillary still gets most of the delegates. And then on the Republican side, you've got the Republican National Committee very openly at times plotting in terms of how to get this away from Trump at the convention. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to end up voting third party like I like I did last time anyway, because I, I don't believe in any of these people. Uh, how can you? But um, <laughs> but it's like there, there's there's these things that go on that I think really kind of unfortunately reinforce that that sense of disenfranchisement in people's minds where they feel like their vote doesn't count. Because, for example, if you're a Bernie supporter and you voted in the New Hampshire primary for Bernie and then and, uh, you know, he wins by a very slim margin, but somehow she ends up with either the an even number of delegates or, oh, no, I'm sorry, in New Hampshire, he clobbered her. That's right. But they end up splitting the delegates down the middle. You know, it's like, uh, no wonder these kids feel like their vote doesn't count. And to be strictly honest with you, the process needs to change with the parties, mm -hmm. okay? The parties need to stay out of primaries, period, okay? Nine times out of ten, the party always has somebody or their interests already enacted, so to speak. So they already know in their minds, hey, this candidate is who we're going to back. Mm -hmm. And then they try to throw curveballs at every other candidate, which is absolutely wrong. And having a delegate process is ridiculous. Go by popular vote. Yeah, I agree. I and, agree. Well, what's funny, too, is uh, this is the grand irony of all this is. So this, the reason the system is designed the way it is is so that they can keep somebody really unacceptable from becoming the nominee. But, it, but in terms of the Republicans, it completely blew up in their faces. They made sure this time around that the primaries were front loaded so that they would have a nominee early in the yeah. process because, you know, they felt like in 2012, part of what hurt Romney was it dragged on too long before he really truly became the presumptive nominee and he yeah. took a lot of damage in those debates and from people like Newt Gingrich and, uh, and, and, and so forth. So let's make sure the nominee uh, seals the deal early and it ended up backfiring on them because then Trump became the front runner very early and there was no stopping him. And to be strictly honest with you, it doesn't matter who becomes president anyways in the first place because of the simple fact is the president 
only has a certain amount of power. Yes, he has a lot of power. He has a lot of say so. Mm-hmm. Uh, he or she, whoever it might be, um, get, has veto power. They have control of our armed forces. Right. And they have a strong cabinet. But the fact is, the power lies in the House and in the Senate. And I, I agree with you in terms of domestic policy. I've always said that a lot of people have kind of this, um, you know, because the president gets credit or blame for a yep. lot of things that the president has no control over, regardless of who it is, particularly with economic matters uh, very often. And people have this sort of this idea that the president is really some sort of an emperor who's like with the economy is controlling all these different yep. levers of the economy and whatnot. And it really doesn't work that way. Uh but I do think it matters tremendously in terms of foreign policy because Absolutely. the president is commander in chief. We don't declare war anymore. We haven't really, I think, since World War II. The president decides when we go to war and, and what we're doing. And um, so in, in that regard, actually, it's funny. I, I, uh, I, I had kind of a, an epiphany about this a couple of months ago. I said, uh, I would never vote for Bernie or support Bernie, even though I like some things about him because he's a socialist. But then I thought, you know what, in terms of foreign policy out of any of these people, whether it's Hillary or any of the Republicans running, I think I would trust him the most not to get us into a situation that leads to some sort of you know, global thermonuclear Armageddon, the way all these people talk, including Hillary, who's she's a neoconservative in my view. I think she would have been very comfortable on the foreign policy team of the George W. Bush administration. And look at this. You ha- it says That's it right. all. <laughs> That's right. It says it all right there. Um, yep. No, absolutely. <laughs> but the fact is, and, and we got to keep in mind, okay, right now we're in a, in a situation that we got three individuals that is going for president, okay? Either which one of them, doesn't matter what you put in, some are stronger than others, and, you know, some have special interest at their own heart or their own ways. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter which one we put in. We're honestly, we're not in trouble, but on the other hand, um it doesn't even matter. Uh so 2016 when we when the voters go to those polls, they got to choose who the you know, they they got to vote for the senators. Mm-hmm. They got to vote for the congressmen. Um you know, in the in the federal delegation and what we need to do is really take in hard look on who you're voting for. Mm -hmm. Make sure you do your your research. Try to bring middle-of-the-road type individual candidates in there that are going to think outside the box and not go with the flow from the party situation. And with that being said, regardless of the president saying, oh yeah, foreign policy and we're going to war, it still has to go through the House anyways. It takes two-thirds vote to overturn the president's. Yeah, but we don't, like I said, we don't declare war anymore anyway. No. I mean, Obama can launch whatever missiles he wants to launch and conduct whatever drone drone strikes he wants to and kill as many civilians overseas as he wants to. Congress doesn't have to approve any of that. No, they don't. But the fact is they they do have some kind of say. They do got power. I mean, they have say in terms of the money, in terms of the military budget and whatnot. Absolutely. Well, if you don't give him the money, he can't do... Uh, drone strikes. Right, you? right. Think about it. <laughs> the money aspect in government is total control over how things go. And if the Congress pulls that money from that budgeting line item and reshifts it instead of paying for extra drone strike, take that money and put it into our military and actually put it into our servicemen mm-hmm. and our veterans that are struggling to get medical health care and help our veterans get off the streets from being homeless mm-hmm. because they have the capability they're forgetting about them guys those guys have served their country have fought for this country shed blood for this country and pushed every aspect and did exactly what they were told to do mm-hmm. and where are they now not being helped i'll tell you what i've said recently on the show and this is a people take this the wrong way people take this as being unpatriotic but you're, you're a smart guy. You'll get what yeah. I'm saying. Um, I would, if, if a young person came to me and, and said, Matt, I've been thinking about joining the military. What do you think? Should I do it? I would absolutely discourage them. I don't think anyone should be joining the military. And I'll tell you why. Because, as you said, the way we treat our veterans, <coughs> with homeless veterans, veterans who are addicted to drugs because they can't get the... A lot of the heroin addicts are veterans yeah. because they, they can't get the, the proper meds they need from the VA. Something goes wrong there. All kinds of things go wrong. 
this country has treated our veterans horribly. You can go all the way back to World War I, where they had to, veterans had to uh, orchestrate a march on Washington just to get what the federal government told them they were entitled Absolutely. to and were not giving them. Um, and uh, I don't think until this country finally starts treating our veterans correctly, because, my God, we send these people off to war to die for consistently horrendous foreign policy decisions and then don't help them when they come home. Uh, why should anyone go for that deal? It doesn't make sense because what I came to the conclusion of is this. When you sign up to join the military, you're not really fighting for your country. That's, that's what they sell you on. You're fighting for your country. You're fighting to defend America. You're really fighting for the government and that's not the same thing. This is a great country. I love America. And this is what I mean, you know, again, people think I mean unpatriotic when I discourage people from joining the military. No, fighting for your country is a great idea. I love, I love my country. Mm -hmm. But the government is not the country, and the government doesn't care about you. To the government, you are a number. The government doesn't care if you die, if you go overseas and die. In fact, they'd prefer it because then they don't have to even try to pretend to take care of you when you come home. And I don't think anyone should be fighting for this government. This government, it's a, it's a corporation. It's a, 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 just a, a faceless, sociopathic at times corporation. And I don't, think, I don't think anyone should be signing up to join the military. I'm going to tell you a background about me, okay? My yeah. father retired from the Air Force, 26 years in the military, okay? Yeah. Yeah. He shed blood for this country. He, he volunteered to go to every conflict that he could. Yeah instead of sending a young individual that just got out of basic or out of boot, yeah. um, going overseas to fight, fight wars, well, he, a, he, chose, a, he chose to go himself. That's a brave man. Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. And I honor him. Oh, I respect him. I love him dearly. Yeah. Not just because he's my father, but he served us to yeah. give us that freedom to make the, our choices in life. Right. And absolutely, you're absolutely right. Our government has forgotten about our veterans. Yeah. But now I'm going to go back to what I was saying earlier. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> 20, that all comes down to educating voting. You know, us getting out and actually getting to the polls and actually voting not for party, but voting for the person that you know is going to stress your concerns. Right. That concern that you said I have heard by many people, including my own. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, that's yeah. one of my concerns. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, okay, but it's in our power as the people to put people to represent us in D.C. that will go against lobbyists and that will go against the norm and go against the party politics and actually speak our concerns there yeah. and actually implement real change, not fundamental change but real change yeah and real change and you know and that's important to me if, if you don't mind my asking is your dad still with us yeah my father lives in rochester new hampshire good. he lives right down the street yeah he's got a great family good, you know good. and, and uh, he's okay like did they take care of him oh because i because he, i realize not everyone falls through the cracks i'm, I'm gonna say my father refuses to take veterans really monies really he he has retired. He take his retirement. He works every day. He gets up at the crock of dawn, works five days a week, and he he fights. Yeah. And he he does what is necessary. Yeah. To yeah. do it, and he would rather not take money from our veterans that truly need it. Wow. Yeah. Not just him. I got my, my stepbrother. He was in the army. Uh, he was airborne. Um, he came back uh, with shrapnel throughout his body. Wow. Um, um, he does take money from the VA. They do take care of him. Good. good. But on the lines is they don't take 150% care of him. Yeah. And that's the problem. That is, yeah. That's absolutely. a problem. And that's why, like I keep on saying and I keep on implementing, which is very, very important to me, and it's important for everybody out there that is listening, what you have to get out and vote. You have to make educated voting decisions. Yeah. You have to read what the candidate's about. Look at their past. Look at the history. Don't target them with negativity. Right. And don't try to discredit them for what they have done. Okay? Yeah. Because negativity creates more negativity, which turns into chaos. We don't want that. You want to keep on a positive teal. If you got me and... A heroin dealer, okay, 
running for the New Hampshire Executive Council and you know and you go to the voting poll and you're voting for the heroin dealer, it's because you're not educating yourself to vote for who is the right person for that job. Yeah. Okay? Um, and that's the problem. And I use the heroin dealer because it's two spectrums. I'm a positive aspect that is trying to push for, for real change and for the community. And then you got a dealer that is dealing drugs to the community and that is killing people. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. So who are you going to choose if you went to the poll? Right. I would choose you. But part of the problem with the veterans issue, I think. Yeah. Actually, I think I don't think it's part of the problem. I think it, it is, is the the problem. Yeah. Is that um, for so, there's it? I don't know how we fix the disconnect. See, because I don't think it's that people are uneducated on the fact that there's a problem because it, you know, every time a scandal comes up, like remember the big Walter Reed scandal, for example, but, but for some reason, it's like, when you look at, maybe it's people are too distracted. When you look at the issues that people are most concerned with, and don't get me wrong, these are important issues too, the economy and foreign policy and all that. Absolutely. There's a whole list of issues and veterans issues. It's like that, that goes near the top of the list when there's some sort of scandal in play. But then when the scandal kind of fades, it's like, yeah, and then it's just, there's just such an apathy. That, that's the problem with our system. Yeah. It, it's been the problem for years, and everybody out there could agree with me, and I think you would agree with me, yeah. that it's been an issue, it's been an ongoing issue, and that's been an ongoing issue for one reason and one reason only. You tell me. Party, partisan politics. Yeah. Democrats take over. They want it. They want to try to get everything done that they can. The Republicans take over. Absolutely. They try to go and do what the Democrats did, plus get some of their agendas. Right. There's no middle ground. There's nothing going on. There's and no moderates anymore. There's, there's this polarization that's taken place with, with the parties, yeah. which is And that's what I, that's <laughs> what I'm standing up against. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm going to push for. Yeah. You know, And I'm not going to do it to an extreme that I'm going to do it in a crazy faction. I'm going to do it in a positive manner. And I'm not going to throw people under the bus yeah. for for personal gain. That's absolutely irresponsible for anybody to do. Yeah. But I am going to voice it, and I am going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to be honest about it. Okay. Yeah. And I, if there's something wrong, I'm going to say there's something wrong. Yeah. Okay. And you're absolutely right. The veterans have to be more looked upon and they need to come up with a situation that we can help these guys you know what happens they get used as a prop in in terms of the, of campaigns when when uh when when somebody wants to um it's a great applause line yeah what we you know like with these presidential candidates so uh, I'm, I'm gonna do something to help uh our veterans i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that and everyone applauds and then they go and forget about it okay it's so sad so when we go to the poll, that's something like we we'll say we take because majority eighteen to twenty six year olds do not vote. Okay. Yeah. The, the majority don't. And they're the draft age. And they're the draft. So age. if the draft ever comes back, they're the ones who are going. Yeah. <laughs> With that being said, they don't vote. So and when they do vote, it's because something catches their eye or yeah. catches their appeal. Right. And then like they like Bernie, and they vote. And they don't really vote. They don't really understand and know what they're really voting for because they're not educating them. Yeah. Or we, as grown adults, are not educating our youth to make independent thought process in, in um, um, voting for who is right for you. Yeah. Uh, Sean, we have a call. Absolutely. We'll, we'll grab this, and then we're, at, we're actually almost out of time. It goes so quick. But hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed, who's on the line. Hey, this is Norm. Hey, I, I don't, I wish I missed this gentleman's name, but I do like what he stands for, and I can see a lot of honesty in him, and if whatever he's running for, he would definitely have my vote. Well, he's, ru he's running for the executive council, Norm, so. Okay, uh, for the city of New Hampshire? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, what town do you okay, live in? What's your first name, please? My name is Sean Michelonis. Um, you know, Matt, I, I'm not afraid to speak it, but I like his sincerity. I like the aura about him and his honesty. Absolutely. So spread the word. Um, my question to you, what town do you live in, sir? Right here in Manchester. You live in Manchester. You have family in District 2, which is Concord, all the way out to Keene, all the way into the Stratford County area. That's my district. Yeah. 
Uh, Manchester is yeah. right outside my district, but if you know anybody in that area, which is 46 towns, six cities. Well, I, yeah. well, I have a lot of people that live all over the area. I'll tell them to vote for you. How's that? Oh, no, I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you very much, sir. Thank you for the call, Norm. Yeah, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Well, Norm does not impress easily, so good for you. You, you, you. <laughs> I like um, I like this individual. Yeah, you know yeah. I, I respect him for calling. And, yeah, absolutely, and out, and absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, he hosts a, a show on here, Norman Friends, which is uh, today at four. I was his uh, co-host for seven years. So yeah, I know I know Norm very well. Sean, we're almost out of time. Like I said, it goes so quick. Um, in in a, a the couple of minutes that we have left, uh, was there anything that you wanted to touch on? Uh, no, that, that we didn't get to any any pet issues that are like you want to mention. You know, I, you know, I said a lot of the stuff that I'm, I, you know, I was planning on saying at the end. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sum it all up. Sure, sure. Just make it nice and easy, okay? Um, obviously, you know, this is my first time ever being on a television oh, station, okay. well. and you know, I loved it. This is enjoyable. You know, it, it feels good to talk to somebody and talk about beliefs and what people are truly thinking out there. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, it, it's important to me. And it's important for people to know that I am here for them. Mm -hmm. Regardless, if I don't get elected, I'm still there for them. Right. I will go right down to Concord. I know people. And I will voice their concerns regardless. Yeah. And I won't leave them. But if I do it right and do it the right way and raise enough money to run my campaign, not run $120,000 to run my campaign. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. You know, buy my political signs, get my literature, do a mass mailing, go on to radio shows, TV shows, and push my thing. Go door to door like I did when I was a state rep. Yeah. Literally went to 3,000 homes, me and this guy named Bob Watson, yeah. which is now a county commissioner for Stratford County. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. We went door to door talking to people and handing out of literature. I mean, it's kind of hard to do it with 46 towns and oh, six yeah. cities. <laughs> it's kind of difficult, but yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. I went to Franklin and talked to the business owners and, and you know, just talked to people walking down the street. And yeah. I enjoyed it. I loved it. They gave me their feedback. They told me what their problems are, you know, and, you know, they, they told me a lot of good things. And I will never forget what they have told me. Yeah. I wrote it down in a notebook. Franklin has this issue, this issue, this issue. Yeah. And... I won't forget about that because when I get down there, I'm going to put all my notes together and I'm going to tackle each of those subjects and it, each of those issues that we know is a problem. Yeah. And I will work hand in hand with the, the county commi you know, commissioners, like I said, and work hand in hand with the delegation and hand work hand in hand even with the mayors and city councilors yeah. and city managers of each of the towns. Regardless, I might be getting elected for District 2. But I'm representing an entire state. Right, right. Because what I decide doesn't just... It affects everybody. affects ultimately. District 2, but it, yeah. everybody, the individual from Manchester, it affects him as well. Right, right. And I'm going to fight for it. Um, 2016 is really not about a party affiliation, okay? It is about the people fixing the increasing issues in our state. That's what it's about. Um, it's about helping in their lives and struggling to make ends meet, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get out there and actually, you know, making money for their families, okay? Yeah. It's not about us regardless being a Democrat or being a Republican, but, or um, it's, uh, it's about us working together to fixing our increasing issues and stabilizing our budget so we can get in a situation where homeowners can actually live comfortably and don't have to struggle to make their mortgage payments and they can actually have money in their pocket to help stabilize their families. Yeah. We forget about them too. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. With the um we we need to work together to fix these issues in the misjudgments of our past politicians or our politicians sitting in office. Right. Okay? That's that's important. Yeah. Okay. Sean, Sean, we we do have to wrap up, but I want you to uh please before we do uh tell everybody where they should go online to keep up with you and your campaign and please spell your last name for everybody because uh, absolutely those four syllable names can be uh tricky. okay <laughs> um my name is sean michelonis it's spelled s-h-a-w-n uh, michelonis is m for michael i-c-k-e-l-o-n-i-s um i live in rochester uh, i'm going to give you my email address it's michelonis 
for F O R New Hampshire, not spelling out New Hampshire, just N H. Okay. Uh, at yahoo.com. You can follow me on Facebook. I have uh, Michelonis for New Hampshire Executive Council on Facebook. Uh, that's my page. Okay. Uh, and then you research my name for Sean Michelonis. You'll see a picture with me with a uh, hip hop uh, ar- uh, artist coming from New York terminology yeah <laughs> uh, they came out to help me try to get some drug treatment programs for new hampshire yeah and uh try to raise some money to help out um so that's how you can follow me my i'm going to give you a cell phone number uh to reach me it's 617-460-0782 uh just give me a call and leave a message or if i don't answer right away i will get back to you within 24 hours and really really quick i forgot about this you've got an event friday uh what happened is the, the individual he, he writes music and he he's he's lost a lot of people to the heroin epidemic yeah so he's trying to do a heroin awareness night here in manchester yeah um it's at one oak elm that's the name of the business it's not okay. too far from here on elm street yeah it's on uh friday the 13th um at 10 p.m okay and his name is quite achilles an angel he's doing a cd release party because he, he writes music and he's trying yeah. to get out there um and he's asking me to make a special appearance oh, very uh, good. and speak about you know the heroin issues in new hampshire very good all right well we are out of time sean michelonis for executive council thank you so much for joining me and i'm glad it was your uh, first television appearance <laughs> thank you it won't be my last yeah excellent excellent all right and uh thank you all for watching and uh talk at y'all a little later bye